okay so so one basic question so why are we studying about uh, the work of the holy spirit in the book of acts no why should we study about the holy spirit the book of acts work of the holy spirit sorry to know more about mm, it's relevant okay it's more in depth it's relevant it's the the work of the holy spirit yeah so why are we you know why why are we studying this how does it help us yeah there's a question no like uh, when you're studying anything i'm sure in your subjects you studied you know maybe trigonometry calculus and then you're wondering how will this help us you know in daily life will i actually use it pythagoras theorem <laughs> right sometimes you learn that and you're wondering algebra will i ever use this in life <laughs> right so okay so daniel says to be filled with the spirit lucy says to strengthen us to walk with christ hmm pastor to receive the gift of the holy spirit to even receive. we can be blessed yeah so even we can be filled, to receive the gift of the holy spirit okay okay so this is the thing you know the new testament church uh, we see the beginning of the new testament church and we are the church in the new testament yes or no yeah we are the church in the new testament new testament okay and we know the holy spirit ministered in a different way in the old testament before the cross right we came upon people people assignments were finished and then you know he would come upon others now he ministers in a different way same holy spirit same power everything but he ministers in a different way he moves in a different way right and the way he moved in the new testament church that we see in the book of acts is the same way he moves now okay so for all of us to understand that this is what we have available for us or this is who we have available for us in our daily lives in our daily lives in our ministry in you know in everything that we do this is how i can interact with the holy spirit this is what i can expect from the holy spirit okay so i should not be closed to certain things that and say okay maybe the holy spirit will not do it in our day and time no this is a modern time this is science and advancement uh, why should god move in that way well holy spirit does this is how he moved in the new testament church this is how he moves in the new testament church right so what happens is when we study the working of the holy spirit when we uh, when we learn about all the possible ways in which he works in the new testament church we will open up our lives and we need to and open up our lives and invite and say lord you have your way right i'm opening up i'm not being closed to the way you minister i'm not being close you know i'm opening up and what happens is it builds faith in us faith in what god can do faith in what god can do in us what god can do through us right because if you look at the book of acts all these were ordinary people yes or no right ordinary people people who had limitations people who had failings ordinary people and the holy spirit worked in these ordinary people to do extraordinary things extraordinary works right so many times we think oh it happened then that was lovely just think about it oh holy spirit did then what is it? pavitra atma all those things he did 
today, you know, I'm just an ordinary person, right? Yeah, Stan, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Can the Holy Spirit? Can negative things about the other person? Yeah, so we see that he brings correction. Yeah, so he can bring correction for the other person, like we see in the life of David, Nathan. So Nathan, Prophet Nathan was sent in order to correct, bring correction because, you know, to tell him of his faults and all that. So, yeah, the Holy Spirit can bring correction. But the way he brings correction is in a very edifying manner. Right? So when I when I bring correction, I can do two things. I can just destroy the person and still bring correction. You know, I can do, I can do it very dishonorably. I can remove all dignity from that person and say, what you've done is this thing, you are destroyed. I can bring that or tell them their faults in that manner. The other way to do that is how a father would. The father doesn't want to destroy the child, but the father wants the child to change, correct, so that the father can go beyond I'm sorry, a child can go beyond even where the father went. So that's another way. That's why we see in 1 Corinthians 14 that prophecy, prophecy brings edification, exhortation, and comfort. That's why we see that, you know. Prophecy brings, yes, it does bring correction, but it's always with that edification, exhortation, and comfort. So it's with that spirit, spirit of the father, right? So, yeah, that's the thing. Right. Okay. So, yeah, where were we? So this is why, you know, we need to study about the Holy Spirit so that it's not just an academic interest. Right. Okay. In 1907, this is what he did. I remember the date and time. That's great. But we also, you know, open up our lives and say, Lord, what you did then, you do it now. Right. What you did in that person's life, God, do it in my life. I'm opening up my life. I'm surrendering my life. You do it, right? So that is something that we will see. Okay. Uh, so Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39, right? We saw that. Um, let's go to Acts chapter 4, verses 8 to 12. Okay? Acts chapter 4, verses 8 to 12. Um, the context is this. Okay, what has happened is this is again about Peter. Peter is saying something. Now, Peter and John go to the temple, right? And there, they actually, uh, you know, they minister to someone who was, who was not able to walk since birth. Okay? And that's, we see in Acts chapter 3. Okay? They go to this person who's unable to walk. Uh, it says he was lame from his mother's womb, which means that the way, when he was born, he could not walk. And he is about... Uh, He's about 40 years, I think, right? So uh, old. And uh, yeah, I think that's, let me see if he's, what is the age? Yeah, I think he's around 40. I'm not sure. Uh, one of the verses mentioned that. So anyway, so they go and they, you know, they minister healing and he's healed in the name of Jesus. And uh, now chapter four, they're arrested and they are standing before the leaders of the church, the rulers of the people. They are standing before them and they are asking, why do you do that? By what power do you do these things? Okay. Verse 8, let's read. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if this day we are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected, uh, you know, uh, and yeah, I think we can stop there, right? And then he goes on to say, salvation is no other name except in Jesus, right? So several things we see here, okay? So they're asking the question, by what power has this been done, okay? So here... Verse 8 says, Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay. Now, what happened in Acts chapter 2? Was Peter filled with the Holy Spirit? Was he baptized in the Holy Spirit? Yes. 
it says here that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. So which means we learn that, yes, there is one baptism of the Holy Spirit, right, which releases the gifts and, and so on. But there are many infillings of the Holy Spirit. And that's why, you know, in Scripture we see that exhortation, be filled with the Spirit. Do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. So we can be filled with the Holy Spirit multiple times, many times. And we ought to just ask him and say, Lord, fill me. Right? So Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, he tells them very boldly, it is because of the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Okay, This is Jesus' work. By him, this man stands before you whole. So very boldly. The thing is, we should understand that those who are called or those who are following Jesus, you know, uh, after this, this major persecution, the religious leaders, they were always against anyone, you know, they, because they got Jesus crucified and they were against anyone teaching or doing things. So they arrested and they're saying, how do you do this? How did this happen? Okay. Now, one thing to understand is that here's Peter now, if you look at uh, in the Gospels, what did Peter do when these religious leaders took Jesus? And you remember that? That night, you know, he was betrayed and everything. So he was taken, he was cursed, scourged. And the same religious leaders, actually same characters are there. It's not too long ago, right? So the same people are there. And it's the same, maybe Peter could even recognize some of those people who were there. But it's a different Peter. Right? So when we read about what happened in the, uh, to Peter in the Gospels, who asked? There was a servant lady. Right? She came and said, hey, I saw you with Jesus. I saw you with Jesus. I remember you saw you with Jesus. And he refuted that. He says, I don't even know Jesus. Yeah? I don't even know Jesus. And if you read through, he says, it says that he started, you know, cursing Peter, same Peter. He started cursing and he's, you know, shouting and he's saying, I don't know, you know, you're lying. I don't know this person. I don't know Jesus. Right? And he's betraying or, or denying Jesus. He's saying, I don't know this person. Who is this Jesus? I don't know. And here, it seems like a very different Peter. And the only difference we can say is that he's filled with the Holy Spirit. Something has happened to him. And the Lord promised that, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you will witness with power. So the first thing that we see here is he's filled with boldness. He's not afraid of his life. There he was afraid of his life. What will happen to me? What if they hurt me? What if they kill me? And so he says, I don't know Jesus. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. And here he doesn't care. He doesn't care. You know, same people who are saying, you know, and this is what he says, you know, he says, in the name of Jesus, uh, you know, whom you crucified. You guys crucified. That same name, the authority and the power in that name, this person is made alive. And verse 12, he says, there is salvation in no other name except in Jesus. Very clear, very categorical. Okay. So uh, verse 13 when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived they were uneducated, untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Okay, So when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we, we, we read about the fact that the Holy Spirit makes Jesus real to us. That right? He takes off what is of the Lord and he teaches. He exalts Jesus in our lives. That's what he does, right? So here, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. He's talking with so much boldness. They realize, hey, these guys are not trained. They are uneducated. And here is it. They are quoting scripture, you know, verse 11. This is the stone which was rejected by the builders, which had become the chief cornerstone, right? So that's, uh, yeah, that's from the Old Testament, from one of the Psalms. And then he's like, wow, who are these guys, right? And they realize that they had been with Jesus. Okay, so that, you know, that should tell us something, you know, when we are baptized with the Holy Spirit, there is transformation, there is change, there is hope. Right? Our temperament changes. Our temperamentally, we are transformed. Of course, we need to cooperate. Right? Um, but 
Peter chose to, you know, just cooperate with the Holy Spirit. He was led by the Holy Spirit. Then another thing that we notice is the Lord Jesus told them, right? In that day, you will, when you are taken, when you are taken before rulers of this world, don't premeditate about what you're going to say. For in that hour, it will be given you what you should speak. You remember that? Right? So when, when the Lord was teaching about the Holy Spirit, he said this. He said to his disciples, you know, you will be persecuted. But when you are persecuted, when you are taken before the people who are persecuting you, don't have to analyze, think, premeditate what you're going to say. It will be given to you what you will say. And we see here, Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is the second time in, short, in a short time. He's filled with the Holy Spirit and he is saying some things. He's quoting from scripture again. Earlier he was quoting from Joel chapter 2. Here he's quoting from Psalms and, and he's saying, you know, this is about Jesus. And, uh, and we see that, that prophecy also coming through or that what Jesus taught about the Holy Spirit coming true. Right? That when they are persecuted, it will be given them what they should speak, and they, uh, yeah. Okay, uh, Daniel's question. Uh, so, Daniel D is different from Daniel Oliver, is it? Okay. Do we have to speak in tongues to be saved? No, we don't have to speak in tongues to be saved. Okay. And uh, Romans 10 9 is the answer. Um, what should we do? What must we do to be saved? And also Acts chapter 2, verse 39 is the answer. 38, 39 is the answer. Right? Okay. Okay. Then we go on to Acts chapter 4, verse 31. When they had us when they had prayed. So what happens is um, you know, this this is something that, that happens to them, Peter and John, and uh, they are arrested and they are asked, you know, interrogated, and they say they testify with great power and boldness they testify and say this is what um, the uh, this is how he was um, uh, this is how he was healed right then they go back to their friends they go back and they tell them all that the chief priests had, had said and the elders had said and they start praying okay so they go back home they go back to their friends after this incident and they uh, tell them, you know, this is what happened. We were arrested. They told us not to speak in the name of Jesus. Um, but, you know, we, this is what we did. And, uh, and everybody starts praying. Okay? They start praying. Verses 23, uh, 24 onwards, right, is the prayer. Everybody gets together and they pray. Verse 24, Acts chapter 4, verse 24. Okay, onwards is the prayer. Verse 31 says, when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Okay. So this is what happened. They prayed. Yeah. Go ahead. Regarding Peter. So uh, when we read about baptism of the Holy Spirit, uh, we see that uh, it's an experience which results in the release of uh, the gifts of the Spirit, you know, and the re release of the power and so on. And it's for every believer. And when we see that baptism is a one-time thing, that you are baptized with the Holy Spirit and the new experiences. But we see that infilling or filling of the Holy Spirit happening multiple times in the lives of the disciples, right? Like we just now four chapter four twice we see they are filled with the holy spirit so which means that um uh, you know when we, uh, we we will actually go into the depths of this when we study about the baptism of the holy spirit but when we are baptized with the holy spirit it is right to say that we are filled with the holy spirit but every time we are filled with the holy spirit it would be incorrect to say that we are baptized with the holy spirit right? but every time we are baptized so what is the difference the baptism so we can say maybe it's the first time that we are experiencing, you know, as a believer, as a disciple of the Lord, that the Holy Spirit gives us that experience. Right? So maybe we can say it is the first time. And we are filled with the Holy Spirit. Right? Um, but there are multiple times when we are filled with the Holy Spirit and 
not necessarily say we are baptized. Yeah. I think it's a, yeah, we look at it some more, right? Uh, yeah. Okay, so, um, yeah, see, uh, uh, yeah, in, in, uh, just to uh, follow up with that answer, if you actually read, uh, there are five places in scripture, in, in the book of Acts, where it talks about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Five places where we read that believers who trusted in Jesus are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2 is one. Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 19. Five places. In all these places, it talks about people who became believers and then they are baptized with the Spirit. Yeah, they, they fall, they did. and it's it's like the first time, first time occurrence in all these places. But we also see oh, Paul saying, be filled with the Spirit. He's telling the people who are already filled, who are already following Jesus. So, so my answer is based on that. Okay. Okay, so let's move on. Um, so from this we understand that you know, this baptism of the Holy Spirit, it results in transformation. Here is a man who denied Jesus, and here is a man who is testifying about Jesus. Right? Something happened before and after. It's a different Peter because he has had this whole experience of being baptized, being filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, okay let's move to Acts chapter 5. Okay, Acts chapter 5. We see something happening here, and um, we read about who the Holy Spirit is, we re read about the deity of the Holy Spirit, right? Acts chapter 5, it talks about Ananias and Sapphira. Okay, maybe we won't read through the whole thing. I'll just pick out the verse. Uh, Ananias and Sapphira, uh, uh, a married couple. Okay, so uh, just a background to that, people who are actually selling off property and giving that money to the disciples to distribute to everyone who has need. Okay, so people have need, they're saying, selling it, you know, I have this money, so why don't you give it to people who have need? They were doing that. So this couple, Ananias and Sapphira, they do the same thing, but there's a difference, right? They What they decide is they sell something and they say, okay, I don't want to give this whole thing, right? I'm going to keep back. But they, in, in, in the way they did it, they, they pretended as if they were giving the whole thing. Okay, that was the only mistake or only difference right they they gave money but they did it as if to show that this was the entire money which was which came from the sale of the land but they knew that they were actually keeping back a part of it okay so that's the background so um <clears throat> so we see here um verse 3 acts chapter 5 and verse 3 okay acts chapter 5 and verse 3 but Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? Okay. So what has he done? Did he, did he speak a lie? He acted something. He did something which was lying to the Holy Spirit. Okay. So he's saying Satan has filled your heart and you, you lied to the Holy Spirit. Verse 4 said, while it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not your own control? Why have you conceived this in your heart? You have lied to, you have not lied to men, but to God. Okay, so he's saying you have lied to the Holy Spirit. You have not lied to men, but to God. Okay, so God, the Holy Spirit, you have lied to right now. Okay, and then something terrible happens. Ananias falls down, dead. Then after some time, Sapphira, his wife, comes. The same thing, right? Verse 9, Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Okay? So he says that, and then Sapphira also falls down, and there's a great fear. So now, uh, certain things that we observe here is, how did Peter know? All right? How did Peter know? They brought money, they kept it and said, Peter, please use it, please distribute it. This is all the money that we got when we sold our land. Right? They must have said that. So 
how did Peter know that they kept part of it? Again, it was revealed by the Holy Spirit. Because Peter very clearly says that you have not lied to man, but you have actually lied to God. Right? So God knows the intents of our heart. Yeah. Um, yes. Question. Yeah, Sorry. I can't. Um, I can't see the scriptures. I can only see it for Acts four through eight. Can you um, move it up on the on the notes? I'm sorry. I said I can't see the verse that you were reading, Acts five, on the notes. Can you move it up? Oh, okay, okay, okay. And sure. also, too, I have another question. When I printed this out, it didn't have all the scriptures. Did you modify this? Um, just one second, Shani. Yeah, okay, sorry. I, you can see the scripture. Yeah, uh, go ahead. What was the second question? When I printed this out a couple weeks ago, I just have a list of scriptures. They're not. Um, they don't have the actual scriptures in it. Did you modify this? Yeah, this is. I just updated it so that we could. Um, so I could upload this as well. Okay. okay. Yeah, I just. Uh, I just thought it would be convenient for us to go through instead of turning in. So, yeah. Okay. Um, Diksha's question, Diksha here, you asked, okay, uh, Pass, if we got Holy Spirit one time, then why are we sometimes unable to feel the work of the Holy Spirit in our life? Does the Holy Spirit leave us? Okay, the, the answer is no, we don't, uh, the Holy Spirit does not leave us, that's for sure. Like we can, we can say, okay, how do you say that for sure? Right, because he has come to indwell us, several scriptures, um, we looked at it, but then let's let's look at that uh, those scriptures again. We go to John chapter fourteen, okay? Um, John chapter fourteen and um, verses fifteen and sixteen. If you love me, keep my commands, commandments, and I will pray the Father, and He will give you another Helper that He may abide with you forever. Okay, so verse sixteen is very clear. The Lord is talking about how the Holy Spirit will come and abide with us forever. So that's one. Another verse that we can go to is in Ephesians chapter 1. Um, Ephesians 1. Uh, it says, uh, in him, uh, 1 and verse 13, in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That's 13. Verse 14. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So it's talking about uh, what does that verse mean? That means that, you know, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. You have the presence of the Holy Spirit, indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. He is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchase position, which means until the final redemption. The okay, final redemption is when we receive glorified bodies. Now we have gone against spirit. Our mind needs to be renewed consecrated as we live our life the final redemption is when our bodies are glorified we receive glorified bodies until that final redemption so he's saying hey this is the guarantee the holy spirit is our guarantee until that time okay so holy spirit he will not leave us right um, but the thing is when we let's say we we sin we willfully sin commit acts of sin then we are you know, we are unable to hear the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. So we are, you know, we we experience the, uh, we feel the uh, the grief. At least Holy Spirit is grieved. And the thing is, our own works of the flesh, our, our own voice of the flesh, if you want to call it that, actually drowns out the, the voice of the Spirit. Right? So, um, he doesn't leave us. He's very much there. Okay, what if the person backslides? Okay. Um, okay, question. We can know what is happening inside through the Holy Spirit. That's right. Um, then what if the Holy Spirit, what if the person backslides? Yeah, so we are talking about that situation. You know, we are talking about a believer who backslides. He, you know, he or she, you know, commits a sin very knowingly, unknowingly. Backslides meaning... They have actually, you know, they are living as if, you know, they are not following Jesus, right? They are living as per the world, but they made a commitment to follow Jesus. Now they are, you know, they are dabbling in sin and they are, you know, living a life that is not honoring, God honoring. Yes, the Holy Spirit is drawing them back, is convicting them. You know, they are living a miserable life because they do those things 
and they are not happy, right? They're committing acts of sin, maybe it gives them momentary pleasure, but they're not happy because they are convicted by the Holy Spirit. And uh, it's, a, it's a miserable uh, life. It's not a happy life, right? And the Holy Spirit is there to bring them back. He's working in them. He's talking to them. He's every time they hear a message, they, every time you know they God sends some people to pull them back, to draw them back to Jesus, to draw them back to live that life again. Okay. Sometimes it's it's just a week. Sometimes it's a month. Sometimes it's years. Right. Uh, so yeah, even if a person backslides, the Holy Spirit works, brings them back. Okay. Now, of course, if the person um, continues to you know walk willfully in sin or reject Jesus completely reject Jesus well they they can come a point where they're you know completely rejecting and there's no other hope for them right? there's no going back it is possible they, they can do that the person can come to that place but we don't know like we don't know we can't say oh that person you know, once he was saved now he's not we can't say that. Only God knows that. Right? Yeah. No, you're not feeling in the sense your senses are not aware of the Holy Spirit. Right? That's what you're saying. Like certain times we feel the tangible presence of the Holy Spirit. Like when we talk about the presence of the Holy Spirit, presence of God. God is omnipresent. He's there. Right? The Bible also talks about the fact that where two or three are gathered, the Lord Jesus said, I am there in their midst. So we have the promised presence of God. We have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Right? So he convicts us. We feel the joy of the Spirit. Right? He bears the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience. You know. um, conviction from sin. So we feel that. That is also the presence of the Holy Spirit. Right? And at times, like maybe in times of worship, maybe we are praying in the Spirit and engaging, reading the Word. We feel the tangible presence of the Holy Spirit. But you know in your heart, God is God is here. Right? God is here. And, and maybe you're worshipping and you're praying and you, you feel in your heart, wow, God is here. Right? It's so close. That's the manifest presence of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes you, the presence of God is so strong and uh, so real that you can't even say anything. You know, sometimes it's just tears. Just like, You don't know why. Maybe it's just laughter and joy bubbling up and you don't know why. But it's the presence of God. It's so strong. So we feel all that. You know, all that is true. It is the presence of God. Sometimes we, there is not the tangible manifest presence of God, but that does not mean that the Holy Spirit has left. He is there. Okay. Um, and the promise of the Lord is that he will stay with us forever. Okay. How do we immediately obey when the Holy Spirit is guiding us, things to do or don't, and or later realize uh, yet, but, okay, uh, I just, I'm just trying to understand your question, Lucy. Um, how do we immediately obey when the Holy Spirit is guiding us? things to do or don't, or later realize the Holy Spirit told me not to do it, but yet I did. Okay, uh, so the thing is, um, in hindsight, you realize, hey, God told me I should have obeyed, and I didn't. Or maybe, uh, and then you reap the consequences of that decision. You know, you feel that, okay, I maybe today I need to do this. And then uh, you didn't do it, but then later you realize hey, that was actually the Spirit of God speaking. So it's a journey. Okay, so it's a journey. So the next time when you feel the same thing in your heart, right, saying that, okay, that maybe that's God's spirit saying, speaking, go ahead and obey, right? So do it. And, um, and yes, yeah, you will see the fruit of it. Okay. So it's a journey. It's a relationship, right? Our walk with God is not a formula, but it's a journey. It's a, it's a relationship. So, um, so we, we get to understand, we get to learn we get to have clarity about how he speaks to us and how he leads us. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. I hope that helped. Yeah.
Yeah, Lucy. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So also, you know, your question could be, you know, we, we, we're going to learn about how the Holy Spirit works in the life of a believer. Your question could be, you know, how do I know this is the voice of the Holy Spirit, right? So that's where the whole thing of having the word in our heart, because he will agree with the word, right? And how um, the how we grow in our understanding of the word and when he quickens the word we know it in our heart and uh, and sometimes we need to put away the things of the flesh right? maybe our own fears prevent us from doing certain things or maybe our own desires draw us into doing certain things and we think okay god wants me to do this right it's our own desire so we will know what is of the flesh what is not of the flesh and the word of god Hebrews 4.12 says that the word of God is living, uh, alive, powerful, and quick, uh, and sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing even to the division of soul and spirit. The intense thoughts of the, in, in our, what is in our mind and the intents of the heart. So the word of God will be the discerner. So it's we need to be filled with the word of God. There need to be a rich deposit in the word of God. And that's always a, a safeguard and also a reference point uh, to be led by the Spirit of God, right? Okay, so let's move on to the next one. So we read about Ananias and Sapphira. We see that hey, Peter knew because of the leading of the Holy Spirit and speaker. I mean, Peter spoke these things. God, the Holy Spirit, you know, he knew these things. So when we lie, we lie to uh, to the to God, Peter says. You know, you're lying to God and so on. Okay, yeah, Shani? Yeah, I just want to um, clarify. I know you were saying earlier when when you you were saying that when somebody is in sin, that the that your flesh is drowning out the voice of God. Is that what you said? I'm sorry. Uh, me again. When you, uh, when, when, you when, when you were talking about in terms of people, you know, being in sin, and hearing from God. You were saying that. Um, I know you said in your sin, you you weren't able to hear from God. But you say that when when somebody is in sin. That their, that their flesh is drowning out the voice of God? I, I thought that's what you said. Like, oh, yeah, you yeah. Clarify so, that? Right. So so the question was, you know, does the Holy Spirit leave us? And, uh, you know, and, and we, because we're not feeling the presence of God, and we think that we're not hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit, and that's because our own appetites of the flesh, the things of the flesh are so strong, right? And uh, it tends to drown out. You know, our own willful things, our own, you know, our mind is completely filled with carnal things that it seems to drown out the gentle prompting, the leading of the Holy Spirit. So then we, we might come to the conclusion that, hey, maybe the Holy Spirit is not there, but he is there. He's speaking to us. Uh, for example, you know, uh, in Romans chapter 8, I think we read about the carnal man. The carnal man cannot hear the things of God. You know, uh, Romans 8 and um, verse 6, it says, to be carnally minded is death, to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it's not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. Okay, so what is a carnal mind? It's a fleshly mind. It's a mind which is on the things of the flesh rather than on the things of the spirit. So it could be a believer. Right? He could be a believer, she could be a believer, but the mind is carnal, because the mind is so filled with fleshly things or given to the appetites of the flesh so so that is what i share right okay thank you yeah okay okay shall we move on to the next one any any questions you had a question no okay okay so let's look at acts chapter six okay, Acts chapter six now in those days um when the number of the disciples was multiplying there arose a complaint against the hebrews by the hellenists because the widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over the business, over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Okay, so so early church administrative problem right so they're saying okay some people are not giving the food and these are these greek speaking widows and so um, so they have a problem against the you know hebrew speaking people and then they're saying that hey uh, 
the, our people are getting neglected. The widows there are neglect, getting neglected. And so Peter says, you know, um, instead of us, um, sorry, not Peter, the disciples, so they say that instead of us getting into this, we want to appoint seven people who can actually look into this matter, right? And look at the quality attribute they say is, first of all, they say men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. Okay? Men of a good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. So these people were selected. There were seven of them. The names are mentioned there. And it says, you know, Stephen and Philip and, and all the others, they were men of faith, of good reputation and full of the Holy Spirit, which means they were people who were baptized in the Holy Spirit and uh, full of the Holy Spirit. You know, I was just thinking, you know, how do you know a person is full of the Holy Spirit? Right? Is there some indicator, some fuel tank shows, you know, full, empty? How do you know? It's by the works which follow, right? So it says here um, <clears throat> uh, about Stephen, he was a man full of faith. How do you know he's a man of, full of faith? It comes out in the speech. It comes out in the action, right? Maybe he's facing a difficult time. How can you say he's a man full of faith? He's saying, hey, I'm trusting in God. No problem. I'm trusting in God. I'm not going to be swayed by this. I'm trusting. I'm not going to run away. I'm trusting in God. Right? Similarly, a man who's full of faith. And you know, when you go to verse 8, okay, we are in Acts chapter 6. We are looking at verse 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Okay. He was full of faith. He was full of power because he was full of the Holy Spirit. And his ministry testified to that, that he was a man of faith, he was a man of power, because the Holy Spirit says that he did great signs, great wonders among the people. And if you, uh, you, know, if you look at um, uh, Stephen's life, we see that they could not resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Okay, let's look at verse 10. He, uh, verse 8 onwards, it says that he did great things, signs, wonders among the people. Verse 9 says that there arose some people from the synagogue. Verse 10 says, but they were not able to resist. Right? Resist what? Resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Which means they were not able to resist the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, they were not able to resist the things that he was speaking. It made so much sense, right? It, it made so much sense. It was in line with scripture that they knew because they were people from the synagogue and it made sense. They were not able to resist. So what did they do? They said, okay, we need to finish him off. This talking and reasoning is not helping because we're not able to you know, resist that. What he speaks seems to be the truth, right? And not only that, but his speaking is also accompanied by some supernatural things which we cannot deny. Okay, so they decided to blaspheme. They decided to say things against him, false charges. So it says, verse 11, then they secretly in induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. False charges. Then they actually, um, you know, they got him... Uh, uh, got, got him martyred, right? Got him executed. So we read about that in chapter 7. Okay. okay, what is the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Okay, fruit of the Holy Spirit is the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. You know, fruit just means the result. Okay, what is the outcome? The end result. Uh, so when we say fruit of the Holy Spirit, uh, Galatians 5 is a good place to go. Galatians 5 and verse, um, verse 22. Yeah talks about the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So which are all attributes, characteristics of God himself, right? So the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, verses 22 and 23. Okay, If you read the verses before that, it talks about the works of the flesh or the fruit of the flesh. Meaning if you indulge in the flesh, if you resist the work of God, what are things some things that can happen. You know? um, it talks about uh, you know, works of the flesh, 
adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, you know, all those things, jealousies. Then when you look at verses 22 and 23, uh, it talks about the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit, resulting in bringing all this in the life of a believer, right? who cooperates, who co-works with the Holy Spirit. Right? I hope that helps, Vicky. Okay, fine. So let's move on to chapter 7. Chapter 7, just a reference, verse 51, what Stephen says, you know, Stephen is uh, saying, you, is, is talking to the people who have arrested him, and he's saying, you always resist the Holy Spirit. Uh, okay, uh, Galatians 5, 22 uh, and 23, Shani, the, fruits, uh, the verse on the fruit of the Holy Spirit, verse 22 and 23. Okay. Okay, so Acts chapter 7, verse 50, 51 and 55, 51, is, these are words of Stephen. Okay, so Stephen is addressing those people who have arrested him, and uh, they, are, they are just ready to actually execute him. So he's talking to them, and then he says, You stiff and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit, okay, as your fathers did. So do you. Okay. So what is the truth that we learn? Holy Spirit is all powerful. Yes or no? Oh yes, he's God. He was over the waters. He, you know, he's uh, his Holy Spirit power, or you know, he's all powerful. It's brought about creation. We see that. But you and I can resist the Holy Spirit. Okay. So it just blows our mind. This God, can't he just force me to do the right things? And can't he just, you know, just program me in such a way that I do only the right things? No. Because he's given us free will or the ability to say yes and the ability to say no. Right? And God wants us to say yes to the right things. God wants us to say no to those things which, which are not good. But it is in our hands. It is, you know, he's given us the ability right, to choose what is right. So he's saying, you resist the Holy Spirit, which means there is a choice, right? Even for us, there's a choice. We can either, what is the opposite of ex resisting? Surrendering, yielding, right? Accepting. So we can either yield, work, co cooperate, collaborate, with the Holy Spirit, or we can resist the Holy Spirit. That's the reality. Okay, so it means that you know, if God wants me to do something, you know, God, God will make me do. No, He will always give you a choice, right? He will always give us a choice. He will always prompt us, convict us, maybe through people encourage us. But it's we can, we need to understand that. Hey, I can resist, right? So I need to be careful. Okay, so. Stephen is saying, you resist the Holy Spirit. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Verse 45, sorry, verse 55, uh, it talks about how being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. So he has this, he has this vision or he has, his eyes are open and he sees the glory of God. He sees Jesus standing next to the Father at the right hand of the Father, and uh, it talks about that. So the reality of heaven, the reality of the triune God, right? All that, because the Trinity is mentioned there, right? Verse 55 says, he was full of the Holy Spirit. Heavens were open. He saw Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. So we see the three persons of the Trinity in that one verse. Right? We studied the first chapter. Okay. Right. Okay. So I think we'll stop here and then we'll continue with the rest of the verses. Um, so, what I'd encourage us is to uh, read through. Okay. There are several references um, from chapter 8 on to chapter 23, is it? Um, 21. Sorry, 21. Okay. So, just read through that so that. Um, in the next class, we can just mention these 
and uh, yeah okay thank you online students god bless see you guys next time bye bye thank you very much sir god bless bye, -bye. What verse did you want us to read for next week again? Um, you can read the rest of the scriptures that are mentioned in the notes, starting from chapter 8, whatever uh, scriptures are mentioned there. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>